for those of you just joining us, we are now at the top of the hour. And thanks so much for coming to the webinar today, which is ADA coordinator uh, lessons learned during COVID-19. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists today. Put on your cameras so I can see everyone. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. So uh, today we have with us some of those brave ADA coordinators. <laughs> We've got um, Christina Mitchell from the uh, District of Columbia government. We've got Matt McCullough, who works with Christina um, in DC. We've got Hilary Ramon, <clears throat> excuse me, who is the ADA coordinator for the city of Pittsburgh. We have Sharonda Huffman representing the city of Baltimore. Um, and Kim Knuckles was not able to uh, be with us today. So um, we will um, work with our panelists that are present. Um, so um, I did want to just review with anybody who is new to the idea of an ADA coordinator. Um, ADA coordinators are also called Title II coordinators. It is a requirement in the law itself as part of Title II that for um, state and local government entities, and again, this only applies to state and local government, um, any that have 50 or more need to assign somebody to act as a representative who can handle um, grievances or complaints with regard to, say, accessibility or other disability um, access related issues. Um, and, um, and they also um, handle the self-evaluation and transition plan for their um, for their entity. So um, pretty important responsibilities that they handle. So um, we're going to go ahead and after we've, we can go ahead and get started with questions. Um, so I do want to know as ADA coordinators, what have you found to be your most important important functions overall. And I'm going to go ahead and start with Sharonda. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that was a great question. Well, one of the main things that I think my important function is, is a lot of people in my city don't know what an ADA coordinator is. So I've really had to educate um, our city agencies on what my role is. Um, I have been in the role for two years, but prior to me, um, there was a gap. Um, my predecessor passed away. Um, there was a long-term person around. He's like famous. And so I just feel like the ADA coordination, uh, we basically had to do a rebuilding. So just educating people on what my role is. I feel like I'm more of an abundsman for many pe constituents, um, educating them about disabilities and their rights and directing um, the uh, other agencies on how to be compliant when I get a grievance. So, but the most fun thing for me is outreach and educating people um, regarding some of their rights with disabilities. Thanks for that question. That's great. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to jump in? So this is Matt McCullough. So, so Christine and I have been with the same agency for 13 years. We were created essentially by the deaf community. Um, back in 2007, Prior to 2007, the, um, the deaf community in D.C. were having trouble trying to access the government services. So, the, one of the greatest things that we learned about, about serving as the ADA coordinator, it comes down to offering effective, effective communication. And Christine, so do you want to offer anything more? Yes, definitely. One of the things that I think has been uh, most important for us was offering accessibility. And that was accessibility across the board. We don't only talk about like the effective communication that Director McCullough spoke of, but also about uh, physical accessibility. We, all, we work a lot within our district owned buildings to make sure that uh, accessibility is possible for all meetings, services and programs. Uh, and I think that's one of the our largest piece of, of the job that we're doing right now. Thank you. Um, 
Great. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, we actually, the ADA Center, completed some research recently, and the top thing that ADA coordinators um, asked about, you know, one of their biggest issues was exactly what you're saying, Christina, which is facility access. So you've, you've definitely confirmed that the research is right. So um, Hillary, did you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's so funny because I had a, had a really similar experience as Sharonda where somebody had been in the role before me for a really, really long time and was a total rock star. Um, but, you know, the ADA was, I think he'd been doing the job since it was like signed into law and, you know, did, um, did a lot of great things in the city. But I was sort of um, tasked with kind of reformatting my role and um, figuring out how we could best um, you know, serve accessibility needs in Pittsburgh right now. And so for me, that's kind of been um, centered around connecting my work to other departments, um, things that they're already doing so that I can help to amplify inclusion. So, you know, if we're doing a language access plan for um, people who um, are, you know, limited English proficiency, I make sure that we talk about, you know, how can we um, be inclusive about, you know, ASL and tactile interpretation and Braille and making sure that, you know, when we're doing one project, we're, we're including um, disability access um, with, our, with our greater initiatives. And that goes along with parks and our, our right of way and all of that. So um, I've really found that one of my most important functions is um, like actively resisting government silos, <laughs> which is um, sounds you know harder than it is. Just kind of um, making sure that I'm out there and I'm I'm working with all of the different departments. I'm a funny ADA coordinator who's in city planning, which is sort of odd. I don't know that I've heard that anywhere else, but um, it, it's been great because I'm really able to kind of navigate um, the needs in other departments pretty freely. And so that's that's been a very important function of mine, and I found it to be very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so my next question to everyone is, with, with, with regard to those functions, what has been your most important role with regard to COVID-19 in state and local government? I see Matt there. So Matt, you want to go ahead and um, start with that one? Sure. So, so in terms of DC, kind of our agency, we served in four different roles during the COVID-19. One has been training. The other aspect has been effective communication. Policy development has been a third. And simply outreach to the, to the community. Um, when they shut down, people, people didn't know what resources were available, and many of the agencies their functions were being modified. So, so we did four different um, activities during that time room that kept us super busy. It was 24-7 for the first three months. And so, so over time, we started to ease into that role. Um, and we're still doing it to this day. Gotcha. Yeah, important stuff. Um, Sharonda, did you want to go ahead and address that one? I'll let Christine go because we're going to stick in DC. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Christine. Yeah, I was I was going to say one of the big things that we did, which was a first for us, uh, was because we had to create our own stand-up hospitals um, in a new location, which was actually our convention center, because we had to do that, uh, it took us a new level of uh, figuring out accessibility. Uh, and this was everything from understanding the uh, level of Wi-Fi that we needed for the VRI systems to be there, um, including uh, bed distancing and all of these new things that we wouldn't usually uh, actually have to take care of. Um, but because we did stand up a new location specifically for uh, COVID um, and also the testing locations, having to uh, access those before we were able to open those up. Um, our daily was really making sure that all of our uh, day and out uh, uh, press conferences 
were always accessible. There was a lot of information that was getting pushed out at one time. And because of that, we just wanted to make sure that it was always uh, fully accessible, no matter where it was going to our constituent base. So I think that was definitely one of the things that really, like Matt said, kept us busy um, because we were always figuring out if there was something new, something else, something we needed to add on. Uh, and, and because of that, just to make sure that everything was accessible um, on, on every level, that definitely was, uh, it, it was it was a test, but as we kept going on, uh, it became a lot easier because we already knew what to do. Gotcha. And, and we know also, well, the 40% of people, 40% of the employees still need to report physically in at the workplace. So luckily, Christine and I are able to work remotely, but we need to come up with policies that you know, incorporate reasonable accommodations for folks working at the physical sites and also working at home. So how do we how do we how do we continue accommodating our with displays at home and there's a meaning to go through some policy changes in terms of that um and also the fact that we have a huge published in dc um when it came to to contact tracing um there were there were a lot of phone calls being made but as you guys know that helped with that person being contacted and told that, that they were possibly exposed to to COVID nineteen. So so we worked a lot with our health and human services agency, particularly in the health department and said we need to offer we need to rely on DRI to be video remote interpretation processes a lot more reach out to the deaf population and 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 so forth and um we really we really emphasize that that we need to make sure that when people need to file for unemployment that now that people understand that they can do it online or if they if they need to speak with, with a person or that um if they need a silent person that we would all figure it out. So, so it took a lot of, of us to get to the point. For some, another point is that we were doing with the DC public schools, and many of the schools were not necessarily prepared to do online learning. And so, which means that. For students with IPs or Section 404 ones, um, they still need to be accommodated, which meant that many of the online platforms that the schools were using were not necessarily Section 508 compliant. And so, so we, so um, my employees and I were constantly trying to train folks on. Um, what to consider in terms of making online platforms fully accessible and that that was a it's still a learning learning process for a lot of folks thank you thing thank you i'll go next i just want to say that um we have had the opportunity um one of the most important roles i had was having the opportunity to say my worth okay because I think that the COVID-19 has exposed a lot of inequities in the disability community that are in Baltimore City. For instance, um, specifically, Matt brought up a good question, press conferences. Um, you can look at the um, federal government before, and there wasn't a sign language interpreter um, at the press conference um, when we um, looked at the president. And I just have to be honest, I, when we, the COVID-19 and all the information coming out fast and you don't have effective communication for the disability community, that's a big problem. I had a lot, a lot of complaints. So one of the things we implemented is we have a sign language interpreter at all the mayor's press conferences. And like I said, we are rebuilding. So a lot of the things that I've been asking for 
for things to happen, they actually started to happen because it was necessary. Um, so I also, um, at the same time, we had voting. Um, I was, uh, I, I, I worked with some nonprofit agencies. Um, I did inspections with, um, it was actually Common Cause Maryland. I did inspections of some of the, uh, the voting facilities. Uh, the difference between DC and Baltimore City, they're like their own state city where a lot of the, uh, like the voting is um, something that is um, done by on the state level. So I had to kind of be an advocate saying um, they need this um, when they were going through the process of how they're gonna do it. You know, I had to like be on those phone calls and, and, and speak up for the disability community. So um, I have new roles now, but I think that was my most important role um, in, you know, since the COVID-19 isn't going away anytime soon, so I have some new roles that I'm beginning, but it was really inserting myself into everybody's role. Say, are you looking at accessibility? When you're doing these online formats, do you have closed captioning? A lot of people don't even think about those things. So, but that was a good question. Thank you. Yeah, I'll jump in here too. You know, just underscoring what my colleagues have already said. Um, you know, the way that we did things changed so much um, during the pandemic and so quickly. And, you know, without, you know, having some leadership struggles nationally made it um, really hard to figure out, you know, how we were gonna do all of this and prioritize it correctly, keep everybody safe and informed. And, um, you know, that all changed, but obviously our mandate as ADA coordinators didn't change. So, um, you know, things like emergency communications and moving operations online, you know, all of our board and commission meetings, all of these things are online. Um, it, it changed the way we meet uh, that mandate, the way we do effective communication, um, reasonable modification guidelines, all of these things are gonna change, but, you know, shifts in, oper in operations don't really change um, our, our duties and it shouldn't result in any kind of abdication of duty. Um, and luckily, you know, people at the city were very, very responsive, but um, it's been hard. You know, it used to be, <laughs> we'd get a, you know, a request for an ASL interpreter at a meeting and, you know, you're good. Now everything's online. And so things have to be accessible, not just to those attending at that time, but, um, you know, we put everything on YouTube. So it needs to be accessible in real time. And for posterity, if somebody's going to, um, watch that meeting at a later time. And so it really has blown up um, and, and, and emphasized, you know, our needs, uh, uh, the needs of the disability community and kind of the importance of ADA coordinators. And so that's kind of been an unexpected benefit, but um, it certainly adds to the pressure of um, how are we gonna get all of this done? Great, thanks so much. So that, that kind of leads into my next question which is what what overall i mean i imagine this the, the landscape changed for you definitely uh what have been the most frequent questions or complaints that you've received over the last year hillary you want to start since you you finished the last round sure yeah i have not noticed you know we get a lot of the same funnily enough maybe reassuringly enough we get a lot of the same issues but um, one thing that was certainly different was um, during the summer in particular, when we were doing, um, you know, changes around parking, changes around public right of way, because we were trying to allow for more outdoor dining, right? And so how do you manage that? You know, the sidewalk is a public good. We certainly don't want to infringe on people's rights. Um, people with disabilities obviously need the right of way to be maintained. Um, and so you know, everyone does, but you know, I, it, it, <laughs> just as Sharonda said, you know, kind of staying firm on, um, no, we're not going to do it this way. We have to make sure that we're going to keep our public right of way, um, safe and accessible for everyone. Um, it's, it's, can, you can kind of be the lone voice in a room sometimes because obviously we want to support our, um, our, you know our local businesses and such and so it it gets to be a situation where you're weighing um people who are struggling against people who are struggling and so it's not a good situation for us to be in but um you know i've been really lucky in the sense that um most of the people that i've worked with um, at the city have been very very responsive um it's just one challenge is that a lot of times as an ada coordinator you know you're not always in the room when those decisions are being made and so 
we try to be proactive, but sometimes we end up having to be reactive and changing things that we tried to do. <laughs> People get used to having their sidewalk dining and then we have to take it away again. And so it's, it's kind of reiterated the need to be more proactive and work with your ADA coordinator before you're going to take on some big shift in operations. Thanks. So, so in terms of DC, the fact that everything needed to go online, that really places all the folks with displays a huge disadvantage to them because they may not have the internet, they may not have the assistive technology. And, and if you're able to get online like we are right now, we, we're using go-to meetings. And so there are other online platforms that people with displays find more accessible, primarily Zoom, and if you work for the district government, we're all encouraged to use WebEx. And when you're using different online platforms, I mean, we definitely need to um, test the overall accessibility because, one, I know it's for go to meeting, right now we're using captioning. But if you need to use the, if you need to use sign language, are we able to pin to pin the sign interpreter plus a foreign language interpreter? So, so these online platforms need to be fully accessible to all sorts of people with different abilities. And so it, it gets a little sticky when you're doing outreach. Um, Public events with different people, and right now, um, most of you would would appreciate this. That um, my agency is currently developing a new homestead community integration plan for the district, which requires a lot of outreach, and which means that when we do the outreach, we need all these different systems to be working together, cohesive cohesively and it doesn't always work out because you know, there may be human error going on there may be um the internet um wi-fi not working so so a lot of things a lot of factors need to be working in our favor in order to do these uh outreach events online so it's a constant learning process for all of us in terms of understanding what do people with displays need in order to still access to the same government services and programs through the virtual world as much as possible. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Matt. Oh, Sharonda, did you have a thought on this as well? Yeah, just, just real quick. I think uh, I want to piggyback on what Matt said. I think the most uh, frequent complaint I had was effective communication. Uh, there's so there was so much stuff coming out that people just did not know what to know. Another thing is what, as far as effective communication, not having the right sign language interpreter or the right platform, um, so people can uh, for accessibility. Also, people just didn't know who to call um, because there's you know you have a, a city and um, state partnership. So a lot of people had complaints to me. People would, they weren't getting their money, their checks. And you know there there was a big issue, so it's always good to have some kind of state partner or some other you know have communication with other agencies, so you can kind of like, hey, I have this problem, and ask someone's permission. Can I try to reach out for someone for you? Because some things I feel like I am just the uh, I know a lot, and I know who to contact, but I just can't fix a lot. Sure, right, that makes sense. You're again, you're kind of coordinating. <laughs> That's part of the role. So, um, so to go into the next question then, um, well, and we did have a quick comment from somebody who said, um, you know, they work for a Center for Independent Living and they said the, the biggest change, the biggest thing for them has been moving so much of this online and having to use technology, big learning curve, I think, for everybody. So um, what would you say the most, challenging things have been for you over this past year? So, so for, for DC, well, I think 
then this question would probably be in the same response across the board that it takes a toll mentally and behavioral in terms of um, telling folks that they have to stay home, that they should be, they, that they can't be in large groups. For, for many of us, where we like that human contact, and when we're told that we can't be in public having dinner with our friends or family members because of this global pandemic, that really takes a toll on everybody. And so, so you know, in terms of my employees, my agency is quite small. We have 12 employees, and I constantly try to gauge how well my employees are doing it, and it's hard not to physically see them in the day in, day out um, um, aspect. And so, so and I can only do so much. And so, and the, the DC government has done a very good job about offering different types of inter, interactive training and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it may not be enough for people to feel secured and safe and feel connected. I think that last be feeling connected with the rest of them, with the rest of the community is definitely taking a toll on everybody. And so and that's one of the greatest challenges that I think that we had to undergo over the past year. Thank you. And um, we had somebody who just made a comment, um, Matt, that, that one of the issues that they're having um, is trying to reach those who have been displaced uh, because of accessibility. So, you know, definitely an issue during COVID times. Um, Sharonda, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I think the most challenging thing throughout the last year is, uh, you can Google Baltimore, but since I have been the ADA coordinator over the last two years, we've had changes upon changes. So the first one is I've worked with three mayors, one, two, three mayors in the last two years. Um, so, you know, you have different political things or what's the priority? Um, disabilities hasn't been um, the priority for most of the time I've been working. Um, then you have, we had a virus that took out our whole um, uh, computer system. So it's like, okay, now we got to start from scratch because we have to deal with that. And now we have the pandemic. So we have a lot of exposure to not addressing disabilities, and now we have to address disabilities. So now I also work in an agency who's never had disabilities in its agencies. So you have competing priorities. So the biggest challenge for me is defining my role and making myself be um, accessible with people that don't even know I'm here. So that's probably been the biggest challenge for me. Um, yeah, for me, I would say, I don't know if anybody else can relate to this, but I think as ADA coordinators, a lot of times we're put in the position to kind of be all things to all people. And um, I think, you know, we all want to be empathetic service providers and we all want to fill every single gap that we're asked to, you know, specifically when it comes to disability. Um, one thing that's been a challenge for me is to kind of stay away from like mission creep um, and make sure that I'm not doing a million things kind of well, but really maintaining, you know, what I'm supposed to do as the city ADA coordinator effectively and kind of help to empower those around me who are maybe better positioned to be um, fulfilling other roles, you know, for people with disabilities outside of, you know, city programs, activities and services. So. Um, for me, like making referrals is, is, has been really important and I haven't been in my job for that long. I've only been here for about a year and a half, which means I've spent most of it, <laughs> uh, during the pandemic. And so, um, it's been super important for me to maintain strong connections to community agencies and other organizations so that I can, you know, help us all as a city to, um, you know, meet the disability need and not just have everything fall onto one person who then can't really effectively meet that need. I think it's important to empower, you know, the whole city network that's trying to um, increase accessibility for everybody. I, and the one thing I wanted to say, and this is going back to Hillary and Sharonda 
uh, as Matt stated earlier on, Matt and I have been a part of the Office of Disability Rights for the last 13 years since the inception of the office. So we can definitely relate to uh, over explaining ourselves and over explaining our role and our importance. Um, I, I do feel confident that um, in this year, especially with this pandemic and everything being new, uh, it was a comfort to know that um, our Homeland Security and our mayor's office was always trying to check in with us just to make sure that, hey, if I send out this new release, what do I need to do to make sure that it's accessible to everyone? Or if we do something in print, What's the best way to get it out to people? Um, and I think that that was one of the things that uh, we appreciated from our current administration, uh, knowing that they really did value the importance uh, and checked with us on what some of the best ways to do some of the things were. Uh, and, and everything from making sure that some things were not only uh, captioned through a live captioner, but also an ASL interpreter or even for some of the uh, public announcements that were going out because their things were changing. Some of the testing sites were changing daily and things of that nature. Uh, just still taking that extra step just to make sure uh, that we were completely inclusive. And, and I think that's something that did take, uh, took us some time to, to get to that point to where uh, inclusive was included on the checklist of things people had to do. Uh, but I, I do, I feel good that I think that we, we are really, we're really uh, a, a part of that machine, uh, but it did take us some time. So Sharonda, you'll get there. <laughs> well, actually, um, that, I'm, I'm actually going to skip on to one of the questions here because you've mentioned, all of you have mentioned over and over these collaborations, working with other people, not, you know, it, it's important for your job to, to have access to other people who can do things that you can't. So um, it sounds to me like all of you, or I, I can phrase this as a question, you know, how do you take the opportunity to partner up with other ADA coordinators, for example, um, in your state or county or city? Do you have relationships with other ADA coordinators? And I think, uh, I think that Sharonda, yeah, she's raising her hand. I think she had mentioned um, that she uh, has been collaborating with the DC office. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So my role as ADA coordinator, I don't think people go to school to be an ADA coordinator, right? You kind of fall into it. So I've done a whole bunch of stuff, right? And I, I, I'm an advocate for disabilities. I worked in human services. But you really don't know until you, what you don't know. And it was very important for me to get the training I needed. Um, I work in a small agency, and every other minute, they don't have any money for training. So it, the pandemic allowed me to get all the training I wanted, because they finally was like, I'm going to send you to that conference, and then it was canceled, and I got to do all my training for free. And I became addicted to counseling. I mean, to uh, not count, I need counseling too, but I became addicted to getting training. And then... Um, I, I, I have been blessed that before, you know, we had all these issues, I took training on how to do project management. And one of the most important things is benchmarking. So um, my uh, co-ADA coordinator used to work for D.C. government. And I have always looked at the D.C. website because they are A++ on everything, okay? So I have reached out to them. And then when I even talked to you, Carly, I was like, you got to call D.C. They know everything. You know, so I'm just a work in progress, and they have really shown me, okay, so to be honest with you, disabilities isn't on the public budget. We're in the agency's budget, but it's like we don't even, we're not even shown on the budget. So I even asked Matt about budgeting. You know, what do you pay for? How are you doing sign language interpretation? I've also spoke to, um, uh, 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 we've called, talked to people in other states. Because um, I just want to replicate what everybody else is doing, and I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And then locally, they have um, all of the commissions on disability, something else that I, you know, one of our other duties. Um, they have an alliance. So I have collaborated and making sure I go to the state commission meetings 
and working with the local partners and even attending their meetings. And it makes it so great about being virtual. You can go to everybody's stuff. But I was driving to some of these meetings because I thought it was important that I educate myself on how to be the best ADA coordinator I, I can be. And so, you know, a part of that is going to, when they had access meetings in D.C., we've dr driven to D.C. You know, wherever we can get some free training, we're going to take it. So that's, you know, how we collaborate. <laughs> So, so in DC, so we have over 80, 80 agencies working with the DC government. And so, so with 80 agencies, we have identified at least one person that's willing to serve as an 80 coordinator, which means that there's a high turnover in 80 coordinators within the agencies. So, we spend a lot of time. Doing Title Two trainings, Title One trainings, dealing with the employment rights of employees, and so forth. And but it's also helpful because um, ODR is also responsible for the bishop's effective communication program, which um which oversees the Omega Summer um program that we offer, and so. The fact that we have the American Summit program within our office that allows us to form partnerships with other agencies um, when they need to offer American Summit, American Summit within their agencies. So, so we, we do a very good job as an agency recognizing that our jobs would not exist unless we value the partnerships, this co collaboration over time. And, and the fact that the city, city of Baltimore reached out and said, could you help us? Tells me that we're doing something good. We've also received contact from the city, city of, of Portland, Oregon. Um, so, so uh, and the fact that we, that we live in DC, we actually get a lot more phone calls that should be received by, by the federal government. And so, so we fill those calls based on what the person needs. And we, and we offer and we pull them back to save resources that would be helpful to them. So, so, so we're trying to understand all different aspects of a person's life that has a disability, dealing with Medicare, Medicaid, housing, employment, what have you. We need, as an ED coordinator for the district, we need to have a very good understanding of all those different areas. So, um, and that takes time. And the fact that Christina and I have been in the same agency for 13 years, we do have some level of wisdom, but there's always opportunities to actually grow and help other folks too. So thank you. Um, Hillary, I know that, you know, you're city of Pittsburgh, but then I know that there's an ADA coordinator for Allegheny County, you know, um, so I, I wasn't sure if that's a, a, you know, if you ever collaborate with them or, you know, who, who else in your state you, you collaborate with? Yeah, so uh, Kaylin Snyder is the ADA coordinator for Allegheny County, and she's amazing. Um, she uh, hadn't been there actually too much longer than than I had been there, maybe like a year or, or so. And so, you know, we really had the opportunity to kind of reestablish a new way of um, working together and um, connecting the city and county. We do meet regularly. We both... Um, work with the city county task force on disabilities in different capacities. Um, I'm kind of like their staff member and um, the county provides funding. And so um, we work really, really well together. And it's it's kind of been great to start a new era of ADA coordination for, for Pittsburgh. Um, it's been actually like, she's been a, a good mentor and um and a great connection and so it's we've been on the same page with it with almost everything which has been very very helpful yeah i can imagine it's it's like you've got a buddy there to <laughs> to work with and you know uses a sounding board too so Absolutely. um 
So then again, in, in the area of collaborations, um, what do each of you consider, or who do you consider to be some of the most important um, agencies, organizations to part partner with outside of other ADA coordinators? I can go. Um, so the great thing about being ADA coordinator is that a lot of us also have our commissions. Um, so I tried to, we had, I'm rebuilding everything, so we had to rebuild our commission. And I found great partnership in a lot of organizations. We are fortunate that the National Federation of the Blind is in Baltimore. So I go to everything National Federation of the Blind. It's got even easier since the pandemic. Um, so I'm in the process of trying to get that person to be a board member. Um, but when it comes to disabilities, you know, that's a great resource. Um, I also work with um, the League for People with Disabilities prior to COVID. That's where we had our meetings. Um, and they are a multi-center. Um, and that person also serves on our commission. Um, and I'm also fortunate to work with, um, just recently, I just found people. I work with NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, I've also worked with um, uh, a, a pro bono counseling. They offer a warm hotline that's 24 hours for people that have mental health. Um, that need mental health assistance. And so I've just been fortunate that part of my job is I've been building those collaborations and the umbrella of my positions and uh, under the Equi Office of Equity and Civil Rights. So there's already a, um, you know, I already had, they already have strong partnerships and I just added to it. Um, because one thing I had a conversation the other day about disabilities, no matter what pr the person might identify themselves as. So we, you know, we deal with equity issues. However, a lot of people in that population, whether it be, um, you know, if I'm a black woman, um, that population is going to have somebody with disability. So I try to reach everybody, and I've been fortunate to work with my other, um, other uh, departments um, because disabilities deals with the police. So we have the Civilian Review Board that's under the umbrella of equity and civil rights. We also work um, very closely with our Community Relations Commission, um, which deals with discrimination issues. We also deal with our wage commission, which deals with, um, and, you know, employment issues and, 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 um, and issues uh, regarding people on, that have city contracts. Um, and now we also have our equity division, which I also play a part in because they want to make sure they're also looking at equity through a disability lens. So those are some of my partners. So that was a good question. Thank you. Sure thing. Anybody else want to jump on that? Hillary or Christina? Go ahead, Hillary. <laughs> okay. Um, I the only thing I can think of, thanks, Matt, is um, is uh, the the you know in terms of internal relationships. Um, one of the things that I was able to do because of the pandemic was um, kind of leverage the opportunity, um, as you know, my colleagues here have mentioned. You know, there's a lot more attention to um, the needs of people with disabilities, partly because of the pandemic and um, you know, once I, when I very first started, I had noticed some other programs and done some digging about how other cities, you know, handle compliance. Um, and uh, several cities used a model where they had liaisons in each department, um, New York and Seattle, and that just seemed like such an obvious, great idea. Um, and I think when I first brought it up, it was kind of like, yeah, you know, that would be great, but I don't know, you know, we're not, we're not New York City, we're not as big, you know, we don't really need that. And um, it was pretty obvious <laughs> during the pandemic that we really did need um, more, more help. We needed more than one ADA coordinator, um, you know, as you laid out in the, in the intro to this panel session, um, you know, we're only mandated to have one per, you know, for, for an entity of 50 people. So, you know, for me, um, it, I use it as an opportunity to leverage this program and, and we started a disability service facilitator program in Pittsburgh um, and we just finished our trainings last month and um, you know I've got I've got an ADA point person in each department who can kind of um, you know help extend my reach they're already champions for disability a lot of them you know this is something they're already intrinsically motivated to do which is extremely helpful um, and so it's it's been really a great experiment and i think um you know it's going to be a great thing to help us extend our reach to help the public interact with the city more and let us let them know what their needs are and you know these people know the needs for their department and accessibility better than i do you know everything i do 
is a mile wide and an inch deep, as they say. So, you know, I can't go into like our innovation and performance department and say, do A, B, and C to make all of our social media and all of our, you know, communications um, accessible. I know basically what we need to do, but I don't know the code or anything like that. And so that goes for all of our departments, you know, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, who do our right of way, our, our DPW, you know, all of these people, they know very intimately what they do better than I do. And so it's been a, a great um, opportunity to kind of bring people together like I said, these are people who are already champions for disability rights. And so um, it just kind of is a great opportunity to start a fresh start. So we just started, but I, I think it's going to be amazing. And, and everyone seems really excited to be part of the project. So that's been a, a, a big plus for us. And just to piggyback off of that, uh, the District of Columbia also has ADA coordinators at each one of our agencies. And, and, and because of that, we're able to hear from each agency from their perspective of what their needs may be. And of course, as an employer, we're also helping out with our ADA coordinators when it comes down to Title I, actually dealing with employee employer relations. So with the COVID and, and with any uh, uh, pandemic or, or emergency that may happen, that's when we kind of find that uh, how we work with our employees, how we're able to provide for our employees, kinds of shifts a little bit. So even when we're talking about um, how to make home more accessible or how to make uh, the workplace more accessible and including our new uh, six foot distancing and PPE and all of those things, um, that was something that really was able to come about through our partnerships with our ADA coordinators that we have at the other agencies, using them as the liaisons and their uh, experts, uh, uh, subject matter experts of that agency and, and, and kind of pairing that with our ADA knowledge. Um, I think that was really good, uh, a really good partnership in order to just kind of keep alliances together to make sure we were providing the best way we could. So I also wanted to add that that the thing, agency also has two boards that we oversee that are connected to the community side. So we have the Marriage Commission on Persons with Displays that encompasses all people with displays. And we also have the DC Duty Council. Um, and as many of you know, the Duty Council is actually funded by the federal government um, and through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And, and the fact that the D Council is within the agency, there's has some, some level of although independence from the agency where they can advocate on issues that may not necessarily be more or less in line with um, the overall administration, that's the job. The job is to push the overall envelope, um, put the quality of life for our citizens. And so, so, and you know, the fact that we constantly work with the like, population, we have a seat on the DCH friendly task force, and that task force also has. Um, advocates from the AARP, um, the DC Legal Council of, for the for the elderly and stuff. So so we are we are constantly reminded that that our our responsibility is to the mayor, but we also need to represent the needs of our community and the fact that ODR is an agency for um with 60% or more of, of its employees with displays really gives us some credibility. As you can tell, I'm also a person with a disability, I have CP. Um, so, <clears throat> so it helps that, 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 that people, people are starting to, to recognize that, that people with displays can also be placed in the manager roles and leadership roles that could actually advance the civil rights of the ADA 
in a long time to say I'm greatly privileged and honored by the fact that Mayor Belger um, really saw my ability to take on this agency. And so, yeah, we need more of that going on, particularly in the role where, where diversity tends to be questioned. And so, so the fact that um, the city of Baltimore, the city of Pittsburgh, and DC were all highly, highly diversified in terms of their population that, that we are collecting reminded them we need to push the envelope and still continue to to reach across the aisle per se and so we connect to people that may not necessarily understand where we're coming but uh, at the end of the day it's some great work and we're improving the quality of life for all our citizens with and without this place thank you Okay, thanks so much, everybody. Um, I think everybody had a chance with that question. So I am going to move on to some some more of the big, big COVID questions. Um, one of them, of course, being uh, if and or, you know, what uh, is your involvement with vaccination efforts in your area? And Sharon has got her hand raised. So well, I am happy to announce that I have a seat at the table. Um, I recently uh, was contacted by the health department um, because as we moved down our different phases in Maryland, uh, they asked me to uh, be a lead in the vaccination effort for persons with disabilities. Uh, but I also reminded the health department, hey, y'all should have talked to me a long time ago because every single community that you're going to, um, they have a disability. Um, so. Uh, so we're going. So we've had great conversations thus far to make sure that um, even you know this th that we are going out to um, where people are. Um, the mayor just uh, this week had announced a partnership uh, with the hospital. They have a vaccination van. Um, the only issue that may that I see it just this is all in the news um, because the city does not have the ability to buy their own vaccinations, even though some of those vaccinations are being produced in Baltimore. Um, all this stuff is trickled down to Baltimore. And Baltimore, like trickle down to Baltimore from the state. So what happens is even though we have a mega center, our convention center, in which they're giving vaccinations, all those vaccinations aren't coming to Baltimore. And so it's kind of like we're all trying to fight for our share. So hopefully there will be actual vaccination for this great plan that's coming together um, to address those needs and also trying to uh, build like education on about about the vaccine because I think that you know people with disabilities are probably one of the most vulnerable communities because they're concerned about the effects of it so it's about you know I'm going to be um, giving my ideas on how to do that outreach and education so we can get more people vaccinated that it will you know help um so that's my role so i'm excited about that gotcha that's great anybody else oh that looks like you're gonna step in here go ahead so so in terms of dc um Rodeo has been doing a lot of work uh, so we shouldn't be information about what how the program operates because as you guys know there's so different tiers, phases that that each state is going through or each city is going through. Right now, um, DC is in phase one B, which pretty, pretty much covers all care workers, people in group homes that are not able to clean, people in ICFs. Um, I'm a I'm a person with um health, so chronic health issues. I fall in the, in the category of 1C, and um, we haven't reached the phase of 1C quite yet. And part of that is because there, there's such a um, few, few number of vaccines given to DC, and that's the same across the United States, that, that, um, that there, are enough, there are not enough vaccines to 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 get everybody to get the shot and so so i'm very hopeful over the next few weeks and months 
that as more vaccinations shots come into DC and other areas um, of the United States, we'll start seeing other other groups being able to get the shots. But um, I spent a lot of time simply trying to explain to 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 families and people with disabilities that we're currently following a chair approach and that you if you're not in this current category your your time is coming but we need to be patient because um because we need to make sure that our grandfathers grandparents um grandmothers get their shots and so forth and that our time will come and that eventually um the the, the vaccines will come and larger larger masses but we just have to be a little patient we've been through this for the past year and i know people are getting tired but we still need to be a little more patient but um but ODI is definitely pushing the envelope and giving appropriate advice to the DC Health Department and so forth. But I also understand that the fact that there's a shortage of a vaccine, I understand why we need to be placed in certain categories. And simply sharing that information is the most important thing that ODI can do at this point. Thank you. Anybody else want to uh, step in on that one or we want to? OK. Um, so then my next question for everybody um, is, you know, with regard to all of the different things that you have had to adapt to over this last year, uh, do you think any of these are going to be permanent changes? and that um, this is going to be part of the new normal. Hillary, maybe you want to go ahead this time? Yeah, um, I do think it's going to be part of the new normal. Um, for instance, our, um, our online presence, we're planning to continue that into the future um, to increase accessibility, um, not just for people with disabilities, but also, you know, um, a lot of the asymmetry information problem and, and participation in local government problem um, is really much wider in equity in terms, um, you know, beyond just, you know, obviously we have mobility issues and other types of issues, um, but, you know, we also have, um, you know, income issues and, and other types of issues of equity. You know, we can't, it's very hard to ask, you know, a single mom to come down for a public meeting at five o'clock p.m. or something like that. And so, um, yeah, the plan is to keep our online presence going. Um, we have, uh, we started an Engage um, Pittsburgh site, which is a site that announces like all of our city projects, things that we're working on, ways that people can input um, their thoughts and their feedback and information so that they don't have to come downtown to a public meeting, you know. Um, certainly at this time of year, you know, with all the snow outside here in Pittsburgh, um, I, I can't imagine everybody being super enthusiastic about it. So, you know, in a way it kind of um, democratizes this dissemination of information. And um, I think it also helps raise a general awareness about communication needs, you know, certainly effective communication and, and also reasonable modification. Um, you know, as, as many of us are lucky enough to be able to work from home, you know, hosting these online meetings helps everybody understand, you know, where the accessible features are, you know, in Zoom and Teams and other things, um, things that they would probably rely on me for over and over again. Um, it, it, it's helpful to kind of democratize that um, th that mandate for all of us as city staff members. And so I think that's here to stay. I hope that's here to stay. Um, we've spent probably three times as much money on interpreters as, as we have ever before because, um, one of the things I was really insistent on is um, making sure that for our boards and commissions and such, you know, we want to have interpreters, um, we want to have closed captioning, we want to have all of those things. And so there's a level of an awareness that just wasn't there when I started my job. And and so that's um, that's really helpful, just a generalized awareness of disability equity. Um, you know, I hope that when we are having public meetings again in person, you know, it helps people remember not 
to schedule it where there are steps in front, which I would love to say has never happened, but has, right? And there aren't, you know, ramps or something. And so it just kind of raises the general um, level of awareness and also the understanding that this is really a group effort. This is on all of us, you know, I'm here to help facilitate, but we all have to, you know, it takes a village, right? It takes the whole city to make sure that um, we're really um, being effective in helping people um, you know, access their local government resources and participate um, and be included. Thanks. So, Christina, so, uh, so the fact that Hillary mentioned America's Power Image, so would you want to speak to what, what DC is attempting to actually do and actually um, they assist with saving money in terms of um, salaries? So would you want to speak to the costings that could possibly um that could possibly be resolved because of the fact that we're going through COVID nineteen and 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 some budget reductions? Would you like to speak to that? Uh, okay, sure. So one of the things that we did find uh, during the pandemic, of course, was that. Um, our in-person meetings, of course, would dwindle down, uh, but our virtual meetings were heightened up. Um, so outside of in-person, which was usually like at our press conference and things like that, some of the other agencies would still utilize the service, but they utilize the service virtually. What we started to look into was uh, the amount of time that was spent versus the cost of uh, some of our appointments. So let's say we found that most of the sign language uh, interpretation meetings, uh, we had a minimum on our contract with the vendors. That was a two hour minimum. But we found that some of our virtual meetings will probably only be between 20 to 30 minutes when it came to actually meeting with some of our constituents. And we still would have to pay that two hour minimum. Uh, so what we decided to do was to really look into the possibility of some of the uh, VRI acts that would allow you to pay per minute. Uh, we found that if we, some of the things that we found that we paid for in 2020, uh, if we had done them per minute, we would have saved about $70,000. Um, so now we're just kind of looking at pushing that across the board. Now, of course, we'll always have in-person uh, because we will still have longer meetings, we'll still have in-person meetings and things of that nature. But uh, we found that the VRI will also be more inclusive. It allows people to just either walk up if they need it right away. Um, we don't have to schedule things as far in advance anymore. So that's just one thing that we found uh, that is more convenient for us but it also turns out to be a possible cost savings. I, I wanted to um, talk, piggyback off of that. I learned a lot by talking to Christina. Um, we are in the process of seeking um, vendors uh, for sign language interpretation. She taught me, you know, about the, um, like some of the apps you can use. And that actually brought me to telling the health department Everybody that you have, um, you should have an app because you could have somebody there that comes up to the place that didn't tell you in advance, they might need a sign language interpreter. Unless you have someone on staff, that's something you need to have. So I want that to be the new normal. I want the new normal is you shouldn't have to show up to everything, okay? Um, I don't know if you've been to downtown Baltimore City. I look at Baltimore City and Pittsburgh a lot alike. It's not accessible like it should be. You know, Pittsburgh has a lot of hills. Uh, we have, a, it's an old, we're old cities, okay, um, and I just find that we need to be more accessible. If you have a meeting, why do I have to come to City Hall? Um, I've been adamant that we had, um, I was building the board, uh, the, the Disabilities Commission, and so I, I challenged the law department. There's some obscure law that says you got to meet in person to sign a book. And I said, well, I need a reasonable accommodation because we got a whole COVID-19 and I don't want my people with disabilities coming to City Hall unnecessarily and risking exposure. In addition, we have construction at the accessible entrance and I don't know how safe it is, you know. So they made, the, for the first time ever, <laughs> they had online um, swearing in of commissioners. And guess what? Because of me, that kind of became the standard at the end of the administration because 
our previous mayor had a quarantine, you know, but if I didn't, you know, I'm kind of a line stepper a little bit. And I, so I'm always going to ask that question and make you prove to me that I'm wrong because we need to start sticking up for people and not be afraid of changing the status quo. So I, my, my whole thing is let's make everything more accessible. Let's make everything government. It shouldn't just be who you know and if you can come to the meeting. It should be accessible to everyone. So I think that's going to be the new change. Thank you. Yeah, that's great, Sharonda. Thanks so much. Um, and this is really, really great information. I wanted to go ahead and move on to some of the questions from the audience, though, because we've been getting, um, we, we've got some good ones here. Um, and one of the first one being just off of um, what you were saying, Sharonda, what have you learned about, you know, has, has COVID changed the process of putting a reasonable modification in place. Um, what have you, you know, what what have you learned um, or, or has it impacted that at all? Well, let me just say this. Um, I think it has impacted it because now people know that became more aware. I don't think everyone's aware. Um, during the pandemic, I was able to um, reestablish who our ADA coordinators were because like I told you we went through a whole bunch of different mayors so that sometimes can change and we've had training so they can start identifying some things that they may not have done before um, and I'm trying to make it more like hey tell me let's develop a better process um, in um, ADA coordination I do also want to say there has been um, possible changes long term because a lot of people have complained about sign language interpretation. So it's now the standard. Um, so I, going forward, there's a whole lot of things that people have always said, well, that's the, just the way we've done it. Well, I'm trying to change that conversation that we ought to look at everything differently. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, it, absolutely. Anybody else have anything you wanted to, to add to that? Okay, well, uh, then we can move on to one of the other questions, which is, um, can you speak to how um, or whether you've been working with um, emergency um, operations or uh, emergency managers during the COVID response? Since I'm up, I can answer that. Actually, I've been having meetings with them on a consistent basis. Um, they, you know, back in the day when I had the long-term ADA coordinator, the ADA coordinator was in everything. And so they have brought me on board and actually I have a meeting with them tomorrow because we're discussing um, getting um, some more accessible um, information on their website. Um, so I have been brought into that. Even I, they brought me into um, being uh, a, like we just had, uh, I haven't been involved with anything like when there is kind of emergency hurricane, snow, things like that. So I'm kind of like on call in those emergencies to make sure they're addressing accessible issues. So I have been involved with them. Um, it's kind of been like as an advisory uh, sort of person. Um, so it, it's good that we started to have the conversation so we can talk better. And they've actually had me even educate some of their human resources people about Title I. Um, so uh, I've had played a role with the emergency management, and we've also um, worked in coordination with them with giving trainings um, to our commissioners and talk about some of the, and giving um, feedback from our disabilities commission to our office of emergency management. Gotcha. That's great, Matt. Looks like you're you've got some to to add to that. Great. Go ahead. So, so DC Homeland Security and audio or time. That's actually by design because so DC we're calling going through a legal settlement and some of you may be familiar that um that in terms of emergency preparedness in terms of nine eleven and, and all the hurricanes, um all all of the major cities along the east coast were were called were sued more or less on their emergency preparedness. And and back in twenty nineteen the district settled um but basically what we needed to do was um have my agency work very closely with DC Homeland Security on all of on all of the 
you never see the me me deal with. So so for example, um the fact that we had had to go through COVID nineteen in the pandemic, um we were very involved. We're working with DC Homeland Security about offering the actual suggestions and recommendations on how to push the info out on the fact that we had a presidential election. Um, we were working very closely with the DC Board of Elections and Homeland Security on that. And most recently, dealing with um, dealing with the game with the game, January 6th event that, that occurred on Cover Hill, um, we, we spent a lot of time working with DC Homeland Security, offering how do we make the information accessible? The fact that when our mayor did press conferences, um, we definitely needed an interpreter there and and whenever there's an emergency, the good thing about an emergency is that DC Homeland Security has a lot of a lot of grants from FEMA that could assist with the costs and, and stuff like that. And so, um, so but making sure that the information was accessible, and that has been a very very consistent theme throughout this this event that that the that the information needs to be fully accessible and stuff like that and so so there's been a lot of great lessons learned in in, in doing the partnership with dc homeland security and odr over time and there is a general respect between the two agencies and um and that's how it should be. Um, but I realize that that doesn't necessarily exist in other states, but it's definitely possible. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Okay, yeah. great. So um, we can move on to one of the next questions, which is uh, been a, a touchy one. Um, have you received questions around accommodating people who cannot wear masks and um, is this something that you've had to talk um, talk through I guess um, other other people in your agency organization with how to manage this and what are your suggestions um, this is Sharonda yes I've had the conversation but I do believe there was some advice given um, that uh, regarding masks and I just refer back to that there hasn't been a particular, in, um, a lot of us don't have to work in the buildings, but uh, there are emergency, I mean, there are people who are essential employees and they are still required to wear masks. I haven't seen where the ADA has said, um, everything's a case by case basis as all accommodations. So um, I haven't been asked anything. I have basically given what the EEO said <laughs> as far as employment issues. Um, but uh, I personally have experience where I've seen people say, I can't wear a mask, I can't wear a mask, and, it be, and I, I don't know if that is, um, that's something that has to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis, but, I, but unfortunately, in this pandemic, it's not like one of those things where you can just say you, do, you can't wear a mask and they just let you. That's my understanding. So, but I always refer back to, which has the advice that was put on the EEOC's website that doesn't necessarily say um, that. But one thing that has come up is um, like when you're in close quarters and we've had to deal with that. So right now, like our homeless um, community, um, they've actually put them in hotels because um, people might say, you know, I can't wear a mask. What do you do with that? Is that an accommodation? So they were, you know, at this point, um, my fellow ADA coordinator is working with homeless services and re-changing um, how the uh, shelters look, but they have not been in shelters because those questions could come up because you're living in close quarters. So 
that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Excuse me, Hillary. How how's that been for you? Um, I would say you know it's been difficult. Um, I have received a lot of emails asking for clarification around those rules, maybe hoping for some kind of um, you know easy standard, but. Just as Sharonda mentioned, it really is a case by case basis. Um, a lot of times people will reach out to me. I don't know if I assume this probably happens to other ADA coordinators where they're asking me about Title III entities and businesses and looking for advice. Um, and I, you know, always make it clear that, you know, I'm a Title II coordinator, but this is what I know. And I, I let them know that they can ask for a reasonable accommodation, but simply saying that you have a disability um, does not uh, preclude you from. Um, you know, the obligation to wear a mask to keep other people safe. Because again, we get into weighing equities against other equities. There are people, you know, who have um, respiratory disabilities and other uh, disabilities, you know, that we all know this. I'm not telling anybody here this that doesn't know that, but, you know, that affect their health. And so if you don't wear a mask, you're putting them at a, at a, a greater risk when they're in a store, in a restaurant, in a building. And so um, a lot of times that just ends the conversation. I think maybe sometimes they're just looking for um, um, somebody to say, you know, well, the ADA coordinator said. Um, but, you know, I do help people for, you know, those who, who really, you know, they can't wear a mask, you know, either for health reasons or anxiety reasons or something, and just let them know, you know, it's your right. You can ask for an accommodation, um, but it's not carte blanche to just pretend the pandemic isn't happening, go to restaurants, go to, you know, what have you. And so, um, it's, it's, it's been a challenge. Um, but, um, I, I think, um, one that we've all kind of been able to manage, um, better than I, better than I would have expected. It seems like it, it comes up less and less often now. So I'm hoping that information's becoming more clear. Great. <clears throat> yeah, let's hope so. Um, so, uh, just really quickly, we had somebody who asked if, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I think it was Sharonda, if you could please, uh, re or uh, no, no, I think it was Matt, sorry, um, repeat the process for paying sign language interpreters by the minute rather than the two hour minimum. Um, I think Christine or Matt, Christina had that. So, um, yeah. So, so, Christine, you can stop and so, so we're actually taking the best practice that's coming from the Metropolitan Police Department. We are all, all of the police officers have access to the video remote interpretation on their phones. And the fact that we have a huge deaf population in our backyard because of the, the university. Um, that's very critical. And um, and so what the Metropolitan Police Department has done is is that they have the BOI contract, which gives them a lower rate. And so um, so instead of offering in-person inter interpretation, they often go with the BOI systems and so 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 we're learning from other agencies that, that have already done this and so christina can offer more more details thank you yes yeah, so we found that uh, our police department actually has uh all of the officers equipped with an app on their phones that allows them to have an interpreter on the spot um, in addition to our police department, also um, the Department of Behavioral Health. So we actually have some of our social workers, their laptops also have this uh, same app, which allows them to do home visits or uh, in-person meetings and just dial up an interpreter right there on the spot. Um, and because of the success that it has with these individual agencies, we are pushing to do this as a citywide initiative. Now, once we change it to a citywide initiative, we'll be able to have it at front desk everywhere so that persons are able to just dial up and do it right away. One thing we also wanted to take into consideration is our public schools. Parent-teacher meetings, those last about 15 to 20 minutes, um, especially when they're doing the one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, that's another time where we want it to be available to our teachers to speak with the parents right away 
on the spot about whatever the concerns may be with those students. Again, we're trying to go away from the two hour minimum because of course that cost can be between 150 to 250 in some cases. Um, and, and that even considering if you have some jobs that are rush jobs, uh, which means that they were scheduled with under three day notice. So because of that, we think that having this service uh, per minute dial up services, and there are a couple of different companies that use it. We are actually in the midst of advertising um, the citywide contract because we want to hear from as many of the different companies. We've spoken with three different companies that do it, um, but we just want to make sure that we're covering the gambit of all the different companies that do have the VRI service available. Uh, instant, you pay per minute, um, you only pay per use. Uh, it, it's just a, a really good benefit that also provides uh, more inclusiveness throughout the agencies. Great, thanks so much for uh, repeating that information. No problem. I've got, I think we've got about five minutes. So I am gonna pose one last question to all of you. Um, and that is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so what are your final recommendations or thoughts or tips for other ADA coordinators um, with regard to managing issues around the pandemic? So what kind of pep talk can you give here? <laughs> and uh, let's see, I, you know, anyone who wants to jump in, Hillary, it looks like you're, you might be, or Christina. Christina, you've been quiet, so how about you? You pitch in for us. <laughs> I would love for you to repeat that to my office. They never think I'm quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, definitely, for sure, I think the one thing to always focus on, especially now that we kind of, uh, it's almost been a year now. If we think one month from now, it will be a year that we've been dealing with this. So uh, we also have to make sure we keep the idea of accessibility full accessibility on the forefront. So if we're thinking about uh, any new programs that we want to roll out, even these trainings right now, we've, we've kind of figured out the new realm of full accessibility from anywhere, from home, from the office, from in our cars now. So I think that's one of the things, uh, just remember as long as we can keep accessibility on the forefront, I think we can still manage to do everything that we were doing uh, pre-pandemic. Great, thank you. All right, who we got next? I can right. go. Okay, thank you. Go. I, I think a lot of us can learn from each other because I always find that the great thing about being an ADA coordinator is there are avenues where I can reach out to other ADA coordinators. Literally, as I was talking, somebody uh, inboxed me on my LinkedIn, like, Sharonda, hey, I didn't know you were the ADA coordinator. Those are things that you can, um, like I reached out, to, I just do cold call and say, hey, I'm from Baltimore, what are y'all doing? Um, so it's sometimes good to get um, good information. And I do say I just love the District of Columbia. And out of all these cities, and I've been to all of them, we do have the best football team. But it's okay to go ahead and, um, you know, lean on other people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Hillary, I'd love to hear from you. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much I could say about this. And by the way, you will all be getting LinkedIn requests from me. So yes, and, you know, I think one thing that has kind of uh, sucked, for lack of a better word, is that, you know, we don't have as many opportunities to, to meet each other in person. I was so happy that I was able to go to the Mid-Atlantic update um, in November before the pandemic, because it really gave me a lift and helped me understand um, what I was supposed to be doing um, for the city. And so, you know, for me, I would say, three things, um, just being super firm. I don't, it doesn't seem like anybody on this call has a problem uh, with that. It doesn't seem like most of the ADA coordinators I meet um, um, do that, but it can be kind of a lonely job, right? I think very few of us are in a position where we have a whole team of people that we can rely on. And so I think it's super important to stay firm when you know um, something needs to be done. I've been trying to talk, you know, I've had senior leadership try to talk me out of certain things um, that I knew, you know, weren't weren't correct and so you know they may not always do what i what i want them to do but i have been called a badass by a couple of them in meetings um and so i think being firm and just being confident that you know you're probably the expert in a room um when when something um on the issue of accessibility comes up and so just be confident about that um i think being super responsive is helpful i have a lot of times you know i call people back and just say 
I'm so sorry that, you know, that's either out of my, you know, depth or, or not, you know, within the city's um, obligation, but, you know, I, I, I will always respond and help make a warm referral if I can. Um, but, you know, it's important to manage expectations, but still respond to people. I think people have, you know, that expectation of government that maybe we're not as responsive as we should be rightly or wrongly. And then the last thing is just empathy. I always tell people, you know, I just, I lead with empathy. I think, you know, I get yelled at a lot. Um, I'm sure most of us do. Um, and, and, and I think even if people are hoping or expecting you to resolve a crisis that they're in and you know, you can't do it. Um, it's understandable that they would be reaching out to a government authority um, for help. And so, you know, you can be a source of comfort and you can make a warm referral, even if we are um, limited in our in our reach. Thanks. Thanks, Hillary. That that is really good advice. And I just want to say um, I love all of you ADA coordinators. <laughs> you guys do really important work. And um, so I appreciate you. Um, so I want to thank um, Christina, Matt, Hillary, and Sharonda again for being with us today. Um, I think that that wraps it up. And so if we could move on to the next slide. Uh, for those of you who paid, who have already paid for um, a certificate of participation, the uh, continuing edu education code is coordinate. Again, the Continuing education code for today is coordinate. You'll want to check the reminder email you received about this session for instructions on obtaining a certificate of participation or credits for this webinar. Uh, if you could please email the code above to ADA training at transcend.org by 5 p.m. Eastern Time on February 16th, 2021. Slide 11, please. And I want to thank you again for joining us. And uh, let you know that um, our next webinar, which actually will be on February 16th at the same time, is going to be on the return to work um, in the midst of COVID. So for those of you that had employment related questions, hold on to those, join us again next month, bring them with you, and the Job Accommodation Network will be there to answer your employment questions. So again, thank you for joining us. And I hope all of you have a great day. Bye-bye.